We'd like the uh, crew of 85 would also like to echo Mr. Abbey's thanks to all the folks who made our mission possible and easy and a lot of fun for us. So again, our hats are off, for our, hats are off to you all for all the hard work you put into the mission. And, and a little bit of thank you for uh, all the work you all have done. We have a, a movie here that we put together with all our post-flight uh, video that we had and some slides. So we'll go ahead and dim the lights. Uh, we'll go ahead and start the movie and uh, we'll try to narrate it for you, uh, give you some idea of what it was like to go on 85. Well, it was August 7th, 1997. The vehicle was all ready to go out on the pad. It was a busy morning, launch morning, so we were all, uh, had a little bite to eat, got into the suit room, got all suited up. It takes quite a while to do that if you've seen a previous flight. But everyone was in great spirits. Everyone was excited to go. Got beam away from the uh, breakfast table. And uh, Steve's all excited, and last but not least, Bjarni got his suit all checked out, and uh, he was ready to go also. The vehicle was out in the pad. It was fully loaded with propellant and fuel, and it was a flawless countdown. It was all ready to go. We departed the operational checkout building, the crew quarters where we stay, for our trip, uh, hopefully our only trip out to the pad for this flight, and uh, due to the great weather and the countdown, it happened uh, our first try. Once in the white room, we'll get a little bit more equipment on, our harnesses for our parachutes and oxygen bottles. And now we're going to show you inside the co cockpit, climbing, kind of doing a chin-up here to get into the, uh, the seats, a little bit different view than you normally see. Joe Tanner was our astronaut support person to strap us in, try to get comfortable. And on the mid-deck, while that was happening, Steve was getting in the MS-3 seat. Kent's getting his helmet on. Jan's doing what she always does. <laughs> now, actually, Jan, if you see on the left down there, is in the uh, cockpit already. And the last but not least was Beamer, or uh, Bob Kerbeam, to get in the MS-2 seat, our flight engineer for Ascent. The mid-deck's ready to go with Steve and Bjarni all strapped in. With everyone aboard, it's time to remove the uh, white room. It rotated back, as you can see. At two minutes, they give us a call to close our visors. So we put our visors down and turn our suit on, O2 on in preparation for start. Six and a half seconds, there goes the main engines, which is always a, a really a beautiful feeling inside the vehicle. You can see the tank kind of does a little twang. And at T0, we're on our way. And now we're going to show you what that looked like from inside the cockpit, the same exact sequence. There's the engine start, a lot of rumbling, a lot of vibration. You'll see the big jolt here for liftoff. Boom, there goes liftoff, and we're on our way. And uh, if you watch the lighting condition, as we cleared the tower, we did a, uh, a big roll maneuver to align ourselves for our ascent. And you can see the lighting conditions change, and the sun winds up right in Jan's face for pretty much the whole ascent. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, it doesn't take long to, to get out of Dodge here when the, those engines get going and, and, and uh, start pushing and all that thrust gets going. So we were feeling acceleration about this time. We're a high inclination flight going up the eastern sea seaboard, 57 degree inclination, going up to about 160 nautical miles. The launch uh, was in a kind of a hazy conditions, but we could see SRB set. So two minutes after launch, we got rid of the SRBs. And now we're going to show you what that looks like inside the cockpit, the big flash. So you'll have an idea of what we see at SRB set. So it definitely gets your attention. You know the boosters are now separated. We can put our visors up at that time and ride the, uh, the three shuttle main engines to the orbital speed and orbital altitude for the, the rest of the ascent. After we get off the tank, the tank reenters the atmosphere. That gives you some idea of our speed. This is real time. This is not sped up. Some idea of our speed at the low altitude we're at. And once we're on orbit, it's now time to turn the rocket into an orbital space station. So we open the big payload bay doors and get, get ready for payload ops. Once we have the payload bay door open, uh, we can start our payload operations. This is a very busy flight with over 40 different payloads, uh, some of which are, you see here in the payload bay. In the middle of the payload bay is the Krista Spas, one of our primary payloads, which was a scientific satellite looking at chemicals in the ozone layer. And on the very first day, we had to deploy a Krista Spas to give it as much time as we could on orbit. And here Steve and I are in the aft flight deck uh, getting ready for those robotic operations with the shuttle remote manipulator system, the Canadian robot arm on the shuttle. And here I am maneuvering the uh, Canadian RMS to the Christus Spas grapple fixture 
so that we can uh, grapple the Christus Paz, as you see here, and lift it up out of the payload bay and take it over the payload bay and get it ready for deploy. And here it is, uh, just before we release it, uh, we're activating all of the experiments and instrumentation on the Christus Paz satellite, which was controlled by the Germans from Kennedy Space Center, uh, Payload Operations Center. Here's a release of the RMS from the grapple fixture that's on the Christus Paz, and we send it on its way to a nine-day scientific mission, and we retrieve the Christus Paz on the tenth day of the mission. To separate away from the Christus Paz, we maneuvered, actually Rommel maneuvered the uh, orbiter with some separation burns to get us away from the Christus Paz, and you can see the Christus Paz uh, as it uh, is separated from the orbiter by moving the orbiter away from it. They were able to get a lot of data in those nine days. As you can see here, it uh, is now fully separated from the orbiter. Although Crystal was our main payload, our payload bay was very uh, full. As you can see here, forward in the orbiter is to your left, and the first payload you see there is the Japanese robotic arm, or the MFD, the manipulator um, flight demonstration. Then the next bridge you see there is the technology and applications and science experiment, which had a bunch of engineering um, models to be tested in zero-g and also scientific experiments. And in the aft, and we'll get a close-up of that soon, you'll see uh, another hitchhiker bridge, and that was the International Extreme UV Hitchhiker, and it had a multitude of payloads looking in the ultraviolet at stars, the Earth's atmosphere, any interaction of uh, the shuttle with the upper atmosphere. A lot of these facilities had optical um, systems, and so we had a lot of hitchhiker doors, as these are called, which closed to protect them uh, from debris during um, some of the more sensitive times of flight. We also had some mid-deck experiments, and this is me taking a, a media sample out of the bioreactor demonstration system. Um, what I was doing, I was growing col colon cancer cells to much larger aggregates than we could do in a uh, 1G environment. Uh, both for colon cancer research and cell research. And there you see the aggregates, and they grew to about three or four times larger than uh, you would see in 1G. Just uh, continuing on with some of the mid-deck experiments, this is uh, Kent Rominger, or Rommel as we call him, uh, getting ready to do a surface, the solid surface combustion experiment. And this is an experiment that has flown on a number of shuttle missions and builds up the knowledge of how materials burn in, in the zero-G environment of space. In this case, we we're burning a um, plexiglass, a type of plexiglass, and here we see the ignition of that plexiglass. And we filmed the burn for about 10 minutes before the flame, uh, this little blue flame finally extinguished. This is the uh, Swiss telescope, used to have a look at the Hale-Bob comet through the side hatch window. And it used the comet in the ultraviolet, which gives us a better signature of some of the uh, ions and elements coming off the comet that give off light in the UV. Steve spent a fair bit of his time during the mission uh, doing this experiment. And that little bright spot there just to the left of center is the actual comet. Uh, you can't see it very well because it's a long distance from the Earth. But by summing up a lot of these images, the scientists can pull out some of the structure in the comet itself. This is Jan and myself just uh, preparing the uh, microgravity vibration isolation mount for one of the experiments we're doing on it. Uh, this system isolates experiments, fluid dynamics and material science experiments from the uh, vibrations of the shuttle. And we'll see in the next shot that not only can we isolate, but we can actually shake an experiment with very well controlled acceleration profiles to look at the sensitivity of experiments, uh, typically the kind that we're going to do on a space station to the vibrations. And here's a little student experiment we used MIM to do where we can visualize the motion of rather large looking molecules that would behave the same as molecules in the air around us here today. Another robot arm on the space shuttle on this flight is the Japanese manipulator flight demonstration. It's a small robotic arm, about five feet long, uh, as you see here in the payload bay. We're taking, Steve and I were the operators of this. We're taking it uh, from the stowed position to the operational position where we can maneuver it around. This is the real-time speed of it. It's a very precise instrument, uh, so it's therefore very slow, but uh, it's very functional. We can uh, use it on the space station 
to take experiments off of a pallet, put them inside of a scientific airlock, or to do very fine tasks that we'll need to do on the space station. One of the things that we did on our flight to demonstrate this capability was we took this arm, uh, which has a grapple fixture at the end of it, attached it to the box you see there. We called it orbital replacement unit. We attach it to the box and unscrew some of the bolts that are uh, attaching that box to its plate. And we actually moving this uh, around to test the performance of the arm and test its capability with a, a load on the end of the arm. So we move this uh, orbital replacement unit around and uh, that's a similar type of activity we'll be doing with this arm, which is on the end of a very long arm on the space station. So we just tested the small fine arm portion of what will fly on the space station. Another thing we did with this arm was we attached the arm to this door and actually unlocked the door and we used the arm to open up the door. We did this with a program mode. We also did a lot of operations uh, with some control from the ground, not just with the crew on the flight deck operating the arm. So this demonstrated a lot of uh, capability for the future, and it performed very well. This is uh, sped up a little bit, this function in the last scene you saw. We celebrated uh, the success of this arm by eating some Japanese curry rice. You notice the chopsticks and rice and curry, which was just delicious. We also had a little free time later in the flight when we got an extra day, and one of the things uh, our folks did was some fluid experiments. Uh, Fluids tend to uh, form a ball because of the surface tension. They form a sphere, and here we're trying to join the red sphere and the water together, and we were successful after a few tries. Another typical mid-deck activity is uh, exercise. When you're in space, your cardi cardiovascular system doesn't have to work as hard, so we have to uh, exercise to make sure it works fine. We stayed busy on the flight deck as well throughout the flight, along with a lot of the payloads came pointing constraints pointing at various planets, stars, the sun, and back at the Earth. So uh, Kurt and I both stayed busy putting in digital autopilot inputs to point at the uh, different payloads at that. Uh, also on the flight deck, you're usually busy with Earth ops. And uh, just to give you an idea, we bring back more than 3,000 photos of the Earth. And uh, here's some of the Earth going by at over 17,000 miles an hour. And uh, the uh, Earth observation scientists as well as oceanographers, meteorologists particularly are interested in this view. This is Super Typhoon Winnie, and we were uh, fortunate enough to pass right over the eye of it. It's a very distinct eye. You could see the blue water through the eye. And uh, also, uh, Super Typhoon is hundreds of miles across. This is probably three to 400 miles across that you're looking at. And the way we get these photos, that was video that you saw, but the stills that we're going to show you later are from several different sources. We use a Hasselblad camera, it's a 70 millimeter format, and that does the majority of our Earth Ops work. And we had just seen Beamer with one of those cameras. We also, though, carried a Linhoff camera, which just brings back gorgeous photos, and that's because the negative on that is a four inch by five inch shot. And a lot of times, we're busy doing other payloads such as this. Somebody floats up to the window and says, hey, look at this target going by, what is this? And so uh, we kind of scramble for the cameras. In this case, it happened to be the Aurora. The uh, video here is black and white. It doesn't really do it justice. And uh, we've got slides later on to show you, but it was a, a gorgeous green color that's down the south of Australia, the southern lights. I'd like to transition now into the uh, rendezvous day. Here we are on rendezvous morning, getting ready on flight day 10 to go pick up Krista Spas. And it really is a team effort. The, uh, it takes uh, everybody in the crew was involved, from Kurt doing the manual flying, me doing some flying up front. Uh, Steve running a handheld laser. Here we are approaching on Krista Spas, and hours before we get this close to it, we're doing a set of burns to go ahead and phase ourselves in and, and close in on Krista. From the time we're uh, within about a thousand feet, it's manual flying, and Kurt at the aft station has it positioned here at the arm. If we were only going to grapple Krista, we would have done it at that point. But along in our flight, we had a, a detailed test objective, which was to go ahead and simulate a docking on a future space station mission coming up where uh, Kurt flew Krista right into the payload bay at a very precise rate and uh, once it was just broke the mold line of the payload bay backed back out and to me it's always amazing that here you've got a 7,000 pound satellite 
and we have a, uh, probably a 250,000 pound at this point orbiter, and we can control that orbiter to a 0.1 foot per second plus or minus 0.03 and very precisely fly it into the grapple. Well, as you can see, Kurt did a great job flying the orbiter right up around Krista, and he offered just to berth it for us without using the arm at all, and uh, we <laughs> politely declined that offer, and uh, so Jan took control of the arm, and uh, this is uh, Jan flying in to grapple the Krista Spa satellite, and uh, it's a very gentle maneuver, and here, here it is ready to get put back into the payload bay. Uh, your eyeballs are essential tools up there in orbit, especially when you're doing robotics uh, operations like we did a lot of in flight. Here's Jan looking out, out the uh, overhead window, and this is kind of an unusual view where we're, we've got a camera up on the arm looking back down at our crew compartment, this teeny little spot up there in the heavens. And I don't know if you can see Jan looking out the window there, but uh, it's, uh, it's a really important part of doing accurate uh, uh, robotics operations. In the future, however, we're going to have to learn to rely on other sensors, other than eyes. We won't always be able to see out of the uh, space station to see our arms. You see targets on the arm here and also targets on our payloads at Krista Spas here. These are for a Canadian developed uh, synthetic vision system that gives you a computer re representation of where the payload is uh, in, in relative to the uh, payload bay. We brought the Krista Spas right down over the crew cabin on the arm in order to test this. Uh, this uh, system that used these uh, spots as tracking targets. And you can see them here on the telescope at the Crystal Spas, just about five feet over our head. Very dramatic view. We let the sun go down and we kept lights on it, and you can see it even in the dark, we're able to track the targets. And speaking of the sun going down, as a first time flyer, I found that to be one of the uh, really spectacular uh, sights in orbit. And it comes out even well on video. Well, unfortunately, after uh, 11 days, 20 hours, and uh, 27 minutes, it's time to put the orbiter back on the ground, bring it back home, both the crew and the vehicle back home to the Kennedy Space Center. We uh, started our entry well on the other side of the Earth, around uh, south of India, Australia time frame, our position. We slowed the orbiter down from its uh, just over 17,000 miles an hour. As you see here, we had an early morning landing, and the glow of the early morning sun through the, uh, the atmosphere was quite impressive. Approaching overhead, we started a, a big right-hand turn, about 280 degrees, to uh, align the orbiter up on uh, final for landing at Kennedy Space Center runway 33. We actually did a, uh, a new kind of technique on the landing. We used short field speed brake, which is a technique to help control our energy in case we have tailwinds, and we were the first landing ever to use that, and it, was, uh, it worked exactly as planned. The orbiter it was my first chance to fly the orbiter. It flew very nicely, uh, just like some of the training that we get here at Kennedy or at JSC and at uh, White Sands and Kennedy Space Center. Rolling out on final, approaching the 300 foot point, can't put the gear down. We crossed the threshold around 230 knots, looking for a touchdown around 195 knots. Right now, Kent's telling me all the right things to do, trying to make sure I got it, get it right the first time. And uh, we touched down uh, about 3,000 foot down the runway. Drag chute came out right away. And just a little bit of different view here as we uh, look down the runway. Again, the drag chute's out, and the speed brakes on the vertical tail start opening up to slow us down. As the drag chute comes out, it disreece, opens up fully. The cushion and the nose touch down. And now we roll safely, um, safely down the runway at Kennedy. Space Center after going uh, something over 4.7 million miles. If we can bring the lights up just a moment, I actually left out something I wanted to do earlier, and I wanted to introduce the crew and, and explain a little bit about what each one did on the flight. Uh, first of all, to my right was uh, Kent Rominger. Uh, Kent will be referred to as Rommel, since that's a whole lot easier to say. And uh, this was Kent's third flight. He flew on STS-73 and STS-80. He calls uh, Del Norte, Colorado his home. And Kent was invaluable helping me uh, stay out of trouble on the mission, uh, backing me up as uh, the pilot. And uh, the rendezvous, he was my right-hand man, making sure all the rendezvous things went correctly. To his right is uh, Dr. Jan Davis, JD or whatever. Uh, this is my chance to fly uh, my second mission with Jan. We flew on STS-47 back in 92, and Jan also flew on STS-60. It was her third flight. Jan's a sweetheart. She comes from Huntsville, Alabama. and. Uh, I sure hope I get to fly with Jan again. She did a great job. She was my payload commander, and also she was uh, the head person on the uh, MFD, the little robot arm payload.
To her right is uh, Bob Kerbeam. Um, don't get between Bob and any food or you're in trouble. <laughs> but you'll hear us call Bob Beam or Beamer, and uh, that was a name that came with him from the Navy. Uh, Bob was our flight engineer during ascent and entry, and he's also uh, the BDS, the uh, bioreactor uh, uh, person on the mid-deck. But uh, also he uh, kept us, Rombo and I, that is, coordinated on the rendezvous. He was uh, the guy who ran all the computers and kept all the data coming in to make sure our rendezvous went correctly. And to his right, uh, we have uh, Dr. Steve Robinson. And uh, by the way, Beam comes from uh, Baltimore, Maryland. He calls that home or Woodlawn. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I was practicing that. But uh, to Bob's right is Steve uh, Robinson. Uh, Steve comes from Sacramento, California. And um, we have a lot of names for Steve. Uh, <laughs> uh, Steve was our primary person on the Swiss payload, which was a telescope to look at the Hellbop comet. So he became head cheese, so to speak. He calls it Swiss, you know, Swiss cheese. But it was much funnier when we made it up and on orbit. But uh, <laughs> Steve, Steve did a great job. It was his first flight, as was Beamer's first flight. And they did an outstanding job as uh, rookies. And last but not least is uh, Bjarni Trigveson. Bjarni's a Canadian astronaut. He's been in this program longer than we have, trying to get to go fly, and I admire him for that, his determination and effort. But Bjarni, Bjarni was, um, obviously, his first flight as a payload specialist with us. Uh, he was a principal investigator on the MEM payload, which is a microgravity isolation mount payload. And unfortunately, Bjarni spent most of his time on the mid-deck working the MEM payload and hardly got to look out the windows much. But uh, Bjarni did a great job, and it was my pleasure to fly with all these folks, and I sure wish uh, we could go do it again. We had such a great time. And what we'd like to do now is we have um, some slides we show you to help explain our mission a little bit better than the film because the film is pretty fast paced and it's uh, kind of tough to get all our words out. So we'll go ahead and go through those slides if uh, we could bring the lights back down and uh, bring the slides up. Okay, they, they give me the easy slides because again, I'm the commander and it's, it's tough for me to do these things. Uh, but obviously you've seen our crew patch. We designed that as a crew member or as a crew and uh, you see in the payload bay a representation of some of our payloads also the high inclination flight, and our, our mission was primarily a mission to planet Earth, to study the Earth's atmosphere and how we as humans have affected that Earth, and that's represented on the patch. A uh, picture of the crew, again, I can't say enough good things about those folks. Uh, they did a great job, and uh, between you and them, it kept me out of trouble, and uh, we had a very, very successful mission on 85. And again, they give me the easy photo here. No presentation would be complete without a launch photo. This was a third, the 23rd mission of Discovery, uh, and she performed flawlessly. We had no malfunctions, no anomalies on flight that impacted any of our operations. So we had nothing to worry about with the orbiter. And uh, it was the 86th mission in the space shuttle program. So we should be all proud with the things we've accomplished in those missions. As I said in the film, we uh, deployed the Krista spas on flight day one. The spas is actually the carrier for the instruments, and spas has flown four times before, uh, three times before. This was the fourth flight, and it flew once before with the Krista uh, instrument, which is the, uh, the main instrument you see there on the top is a uh, cryostat, actually, because it has infrared detectors that looked at about 15 different gases in our middle atmosphere, and again, looking at the dynamics and the formation of ozone in our atmosphere, and that was a German instrument, as was the SPAS carrier. Next to it was uh, a large instrument called MARCY, which was an American experiment which uh, looked at two specific chemicals in our atmosphere, OHIN and also NO, which are very instrumental in determining some of the equations and dynamics of uh, what's going on in our atmosphere. And they received lots of data uh, from pole to pole uh, at different altitudes in the world. Below that, you can see uh, probably down in the lower right corner uh, the snow-capped mountain. That's Mount Adam. And we're actually near the Oregon-Washington border in the United States. Steve and I control the remote manipulator system from the aft flight deck. Uh, my right hand is on the rotational hand controller, which we use to control the pitch, yaw, and roll of the arm. And uh, my left hand is actually just resting uh, on uh, an orbiter controller, but above it, the square-shaped controller is what we put our left hand on for um, translation X, Y, and Z to maneuver the uh, remote manipulator system. 
Well, thanks to some of the folks we recognize earlier today, Alan Bartos and his gang and Annette Hasbrook and her gang, each morning, one of the first things we got to see was a bunch of messages that were kind of faxed up to, the, uh, to Discovery to inform us of the changes and the updates and our big, uh, we call it a flight plan or our, our big activity plan for the rest of the day. As you can see, it's quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of pages. This is about 50 pages that day, I think. We have to go through all those pages and sort them out, put them in the correct books, and get them organized for the day's activities. And also, if you look up by my head, you can see a bunch of legs and stuff. It's uh, right after the wake up, so it's a very, very busy time on the shuttle. Everyone's uh, getting cleaned up for work and uh, getting things sorted out. So each morning we, we did that operation so that we could uh, carry on a very efficient uh, rest of the day. Well, for some of the payload operations we did, uh, I'm working a mid-deck secondary experiment called BRIC, which is bioreactor, or excuse me, biological research in canisters. And uh, it's actually, if you look, I have some gloves on, and I'm opening a container of liquid nitrogen, and I'm putting some samples in that to preserve them for the rest of the mission. Uh, it's uh, pretty simple, but all payloads that we have on the, uh, on the mission take time on the crew day, and each one's uh, important, and we uh, try to make sure we get all those done according to that plan that we had earlier. This is a view of our payload over Korea, payload bay, that is, over Korea. And this is what it looked like when we were looking out the aft windows of the shuttle. In the front, you can see the, the manipulator flight demonstration test, the Japanese robot arm, and it is stowed in this configuration. Steve and I operated the uh, MFD, which is a lot easier to say than manipulator flight demonstration. We operated the MFD from this workstation that was in uh, the aft flight deck. We also had two hand controllers for this arm. The, uh, again, the translation one on the left for X, Y, and Z, and the rotational one on the right for uh, pitch hour roll. And then the laptop computer in the center uh, showed us what the arm was doing and some other parameters uh, that we needed to know. And we looked at the TV monitors just behind my head to actually get a view of what was going on. On my headband, in honor of the Japanese, uh, it says MS Ichiban, which means MS-1. Here's the uh, view of myself working with the uh, again, with a microgravity vibration isolation mount. His work is really designed to better understand some of the challenges we face with doing sensitive uh, fluid physics, material science, and crystal growth experiments on the space station. Many of these will be affected by the vibrations of the station, and MIM, which is the uh, little purple thing in the lower half of that double enclosure just in front of me, actually is a magnetic levitation system that will isolate many of these experiments from the vibrations of the station. On this flight, we were looking at two different things. One, how well MIM works as an isolator and how clean an environment it can provide to the experiments. And then uh, using uh, the MIM with the experiments mounted on top of it, looking at the effect of the vibrations on the experimental results, uh, uh, both for isolated situation and sometimes running it in non-isolation mode, and sometimes using MIM to actually vibrate the experiment with controlled acceleration levels. And this is uh, me with one of the fluid cells that we're using. Uh, this particular cell is designed to study the inter interaction or the di dynamics of a interface between the fluid and the vapor above the interface. Uh, I will spin this cell uh, on the MIM to establish a void right in the center of a cell and then look at the dynamics of the interface between the fluid and the void here. And this is sort of a fundamental problem uh, typical of many experiments that we'll do on the space station later on. Here's the, another secondary experiment on the mid-deck, protein crystal growth. And uh, along with protein crystal growth, we had 630 chambers of proteins that uh, on flight day two I activated. And uh, the reason we fly proteins in space is that in the microgravity environment, the uh, proteins will grow more perfectly, uh, sometimes larger, but not necessarily always larger, but more perfectly. And by flying proteins, if we can form them more perfectly, and they kind of serve as keys to solve the puzzle to all kinds of different diseases that are out there and also can help us come up with medications. But typically what's flown are, are a different HIV virus or antibodies, some cancer studies, different liver proteins for liver, liver prevention for liver disease. And it, it's a very important part of flying in the microgravity environment. One of the great things that the uh, opportunities of having a space shuttle 
uh, gives you is to go up and study things that are temporary, and such as a visitor from outer space called a comet. And the comet Hale-Bopp, we, we were fortunate enough to be able to go up and study Hale-Bopp from our perch above the Earth's atmosphere in Discovery. The black looking canister in there in my hands, my carefully gloved hands, uh, was a uh, small telescope looking out the side hatch window. That's the hatch that we crawl in and out of the orbiter uh, on launch and landing. And it's got about an 80-inch window in it. This uh, telescope was bolted to the hatch and looked out that window. And we were able to uh, use the whole orbiter, thanks to some really fantastic mathematics and, uh, and uh, effort by folks here on the ground, to point the whole orbiter at the comet, zero in with uh, some controls you can probably see there with the telescope and get some pictures in the ultraviolet range of the uh, spectrum that you really can't get from the ground. And this was all recorded on a digital camera. You can see at the very end there to the to the, sort of the back of the telescope with the wires coming out of it. <laughs> this looks like another combustion experiment waiting to happen, but it's not. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> I didn't know this photograph was going to look like this when it was taken. Um, <laughs> nor, nor did I choose it to be in the, in the group. But, uh, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, another good reason to go into space is to study what happens to, uh, to human bodies. Uh, physiology does change, and the adaptation process is fascinating. And one of the things you have to adapt to is changing your sleep cycles, when you go to bed and when you wake up. And uh, we did quite a bit of that, uh, in, both in preparation for the flight and during the flight. And, uh, there's a, a study to, to try to ascertain what happens to the human body in, uh, in situations like that, both on the ground and in space. You can see on my arm there, wrapped around in white there, there's a little uh, module that records, uh, we wore it, Kurt and I wore one of these uh, the whole flight, and it records our arm movements. There's an accelerometer inside and also a light sensor. And uh, what I'm really doing is, uh, uh, is a little cotton wad, wad for a saliva sample. Really? As I mentioned earlier, bioreactor was a very important uh, secondary payload we had on the mid-deck. And here I am uh, stowing a sample of the media that the cancer cells were growing in. A few times a day I would uh, take samples of the media to see, um, just to check the metabolic rate of the cells and also take a few of the cells out and fix them or preserve them so they could be studied later. It's hoped that um, by using uh, the zero-g environment to grow um, the cells in three-dimensional, in three dimensions, sort of like they would in a tumor, we can learn a lot more about how cells grow in the human body and more specifically how colon cancer grows in the human body. And hopefully this will aid in uh, colon cancer research and help us uh, defeat that disease at some point. Well, one of the big parts of space flight is learning about personal hygiene. Uh, <laughs> showering without a, without a shower. It's uh, kind of an interesting thing. And they have uh, rinseless uh, shampoo and rinseless soap. And this is me, I think, uh, the first or second time I shampooed in, uh, in space. And uh, it was kind of interesting. You put it in, it lathers up, and you just wipe it out with a towel. And actually, it works uh, pretty well. The, uh, earlier in the video, we saw Beamer riding the bike, and uh, he didn't have his shirt on. And if I were built like him, I wouldn't have mine on either. <laughs> but... The, uh, but the uh, exercise is important in space, uh, obviously because we're in the microgravity em environment and our muscles don't have to support our weight, the, uh, we can very rapidly. So I tried daily, I think I missed two days in the flight, daily to ride the, uh, the stationary bike for 30 minutes. And it just helps your recovery on landing day as well as thereafter from the process. And if I looked like Beamer, I wouldn't have my shirt on at the computer either. So, <laughs> but. Uh, one of the neat things that <laughs> one of the neat things that we're able to do on orbit uh, during uh, post sleep and pre sleep time when we're not actually working payloads is we can receive mail from our uh, family and friends and stuff here in, uh, on the ground. So that's one of the things I'm doing. Also, we had a record flight. We had 11 of the laptop computers on board. The little computer you see I'm working with there. We had 11 on board due to all the activities with all the payloads we had. So. We, uh, as we mentioned earlier, had a busy flight, and all the payloads, they had their own computers. Well, following those uh, days of hard work and lots of exercise there and washing your hair, you do have to spend a little bit of time sleeping. 
Uh, sleeping space is a little bit different than sleeping on the ground. Uh, for one, you don't have a mattress to lie on. So if you tried that, you just float off the mattress and your blankets will float away. So we use uh, sleeping bags uh, and just tie these down to any convenient spot. I happen to be tied to the floor here. Uh, Rama was tied above me at the ceiling and uh, Jan and Steve were tied to the wall uh, above my head in this picture. And you just let your body relax and the, uh, where my hands are in this position, uh, it's just a natural place that your hands go if you're completely relaxed. And uh, without the, uh, the effect of gravity trying to pull them down, they just float in front of your face. You'll notice I don't have a pillow here. First couple of nights, uh, there is a pillow that's kind of attached to the sleeping bag and you can kind of tie that to your head to give you the uh, comfortable feeling of uh, being at home sleeping on your bed. But after a couple of days, uh, you don't bother with a pillow and just let your head float around. Uh, one of the pleasures of coming back uh, to space, uh, from space is you get to lie on a bed and, and feel that thing against your back. But it's uh, great doing this stuff in space. Another thing that's a lot more difficult to do in space is to get control of my hair. <laughs> and, um, every morning I would uh, attempt to do that and I'd have some gray tape nearby and brush out all the stray hairs. And uh, I would always tie it back in a ponytail during the day so that it wouldn't get in the way of the equipment and everything. And whenever I would go up to the flight deck before I'd tied it back, uh, I got a lot of flack from my crew because my, my hair would take up the whole window and they couldn't see out the window. <laughs> so, I just made sure that I, I tied it back every day. Every crew takes a crew portrait in space, and we thought we would take advantage of the fact that we no longer have the airlock inside of the mid-deck. And uh, we have, this is the second flight of the external airlock on Discovery, so it's out in the payload bay, and it leaves this really nice volume uh, in the mid-deck, so we thought we'd take advantage of that. And as you can tell, our crew ha has a lot of fun together, and we had a lot of fun making this picture, too. Here's a picture of the uh, forward flight deck on the uh, rendezvous day, and it, it, it's a nice way to show what kind of teamwork's involved in doing a rendezvous. Here we are going through a, a little briefing at the start of the rendezvous day with Kurt in the commander's seat and myself and the pilot. Beamer down in the MS-2 position, and it's too bad you can't even pan out more with the camera because you'd see the other three crewmates uh, in the aft flight deck. It's a very busy place on rendezvous day, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, it really is a full team effort. And this was the uh, effort that we were going after on flight day 10, and again, it was mentioned in the video, but uh, Christus Boss, uh, I'd just like to add, was a, an ideal satellite. The, uh, the uh, Germans that that ran Krista, as well as the American instruments that were on board, all performed flawlessly. And uh, we were very excited to, to get that news back up to us in the daily summaries on how well Krista was doing. And uh, she performed awesome, and she was very, very stable during the rendezvous for us to grapple her. Of course, during the rendezvous uh, process, there's a lot of information coming into the cockpit and being processed by everybody on board, especially Kurt when he's flying the vehicle. Uh, by hand, and we have some fairly complex sensors and some fairly simple ones, too. This is a handheld laser, just a battery-powered little box with a trigger on it, and I'm sighting up through the overhead window at the spas when it's not too far away, and uh, it sends out a laser pulse, a timed laser pulse. It counts how much time it takes to get there, bounce off the target and come back, and uh, can tell us how far the spas is away to within inches. Once the, uh, once the payload is uh, on the arm, uh, or for other reasons of removing the arm, this is how we do it, facing aft in the uh, uh, baseball cap and all, looking, looking out the back window. Actually, that was really useful for two reasons, so that my crew wouldn't make fun of my hair so much, and so that uh, it would keep the bright sun out of your eyes. Sometimes the, uh, the lighting conditions are very dramatic up there. It was kind of surprising to me. You just don't see... Uh, sun that bright there on Earth. So it was great to have sunglasses and hats and stuff to protect yourself sometimes. You can see the word Canada written on the, the uh, robot arm or the uh, remote manipulator system, our long 60-foot arm provided by the Canadian Space Agency, which uh, did a great job for us. We had it out and busy almost every day. Jan uh, deployed the satellite with it and retrieved it, and I was able to move the satellite around uh, to uh, do some space station construction tests also. And uh, as we said many times, Earth observation is a very important part of every mission. Uh, we have uh, probably one of the best views of the Earth uh, that anybody's ever had. Uh, 
I think this was the thing that surprised me most. It's hard to describe, although we're going to try in a little while, describe how beautiful the Earth is from 160 miles or 138 miles up. I'm using a Hasselblad 70 millimeter camera here, which is pretty much the mainstay of the Earth observation uh, camera systems we use. And I'm shooting out of the um, aft windows of the flight deck, actually um, out of the overhead windows here. And of course, if you're going to shoot a lot of film, you have to load a lot of film. And uh, unfortunately, there's no dark room in the orbiter, so we have a dark bag instead. And you put all the, uh, the fresh film and the magazine that's been exposed inside of it, and you pretty much change it by feel. And uh, I was uh, lucky enough to get to do that about, oh, 40 times on orbit. <laughs> but, this is a pretty incredible experience to be able to uh, fly on a vehicle like the shuttle and uh, look at this beautiful Earth of ours. And uh, in this view, uh, what an added bonus in this flight was we're in the high inclination orbit, so we get to see a majority of the Earth in this flight. And this uh, picture here, you can see if you uh, know the shape of a little country called Iceland, which is where I was born, it's just off uh, below the horizon there, just to the right of the orbiter's tail. And uh, to be able to see a country so far north of the equator is really quite, a, quite an amazing thing. And it's uh, very pretty colors in the ocean here, and it's a very beautiful view. Um, and it's even better when you're up there able to see it with your own eyes. Here's a view of uh, my hometown, which is Montreal in uh, Quebec up in Canada. Uh, the big island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River that runs horizontally across the lower half of the picture is uh, Montreal itself. A little bit above that, right in the middle of the picture, you can see the Mirabelle International Airport. You can see quite a bit of detail in the land uh, from space. Um, and a lot of these, not only are they pretty to look at, they give uh, geographers and geologists and uh, meteorologists a lot of information that they can use to better understand uh, this Earth that we live on. In this shot, the orbiter is actually uh, about over the middle of British Columbia, which is the uh, most westerly province in Canada. And we're looking down south from there in the lower part of the picture. Uh, you can see this town, the city of Vancouver and some of the uh, silt coming out of the Fraser River into the Georgian Bay. Vancouver Island just to the right in the lower half and then the Puget Sound, the Olympic Peninsula. And up just uh, above the center of the picture, the Seattle area. And right near the top, the Portland area and the Portland, Oregon, or Washington, Oregon border. And the Mount Rainier there is uh, just in the upper left corner of the uh, of the uh, picture there. Just a, a lot of very incredibly good, pretty views of the Earth that we live on. Um, this is actually the uh, Danzig, or actually Gdansk, a city on the uh, Polish-Baltic border. And uh, we passed over this quite a bit, and it was very distinct, a ice slip of land there protecting the harbor for Gdansk. And uh, I'm sorry, I called it Danzig, but being an amateur historian, uh, I took this picture a lot because of the um, historical nature of the city and uh, the parts it played during, 20, during the 20th century. You can also see up in the Baltic, um, towards the top of the uh, photo, is a large plankton bloom in the Baltic Sea, which is kind of rare for uh, the colder waters up there. But uh, you can see it as a swirled uh, brown pattern in the water. This is a picture, actually, of the Alps. You see them running in the uh, left-hand corner, all the white Cap mountains and, uh, and Austria, and also um, southern Germany, Bavaria, to be exact. Going through the mountains, through the Alps, you can see the Inn River cutting a valley there. And you can see Innsbruck about oh, one-third the way down from the left side in there. And if you see the two lakes that dominate the cent upper center of the uh, picture, to the right of them, is actually a grayish brown area, and that's the city of Munich with its large international airport to the right of it. The, here's a photo, photo of the East Mediterranean. That's the water you're looking at. And the land portion you see is Lebanon. And about, uh, if you go start at the top and come down about a third of the way, the uh, point that jets out into the Mediterranean, that's Beirut, Lebanon. And it's interesting, just inland from Beirut, you can see the uh, mountains and the ridges and some green, some vegetation. But if you go further, uh, a little bit further inland from Beirut, that's the Baca Valley, and you can see the uh, shape of the different vegetations in that valley. And uh, if you go further inland from there, then that is all a desert area. That's in Syria. The, uh, if you move to the bottom of the slide, the, uh, the, about the bottom third of the slide is Israel. And uh, you can just barely see the, the uh, tip of the Sea of Galilee in Israel as well on this slide. 
On this slide, the, uh, it's interesting that the robotic arm is right through the field of view, and uh, guys like me that were shooting a lot of earth ops photos, I was always talking to Jan and Steve, saying, hey, can't you move that arm out of the way? And, but uh, they were pretty busy using the arm. We were a very busy flight, and uh, so that is an indicator of, of how much work was going on simultaneously on this flight. But what we're looking at here, the right part of the slide is Kazakhstan, and the, uh, the lake you see and the, the particular uh, deep blue lake about in the middle of the slide is uh, Lake Bakalsh in Kazakhstan. If you follow the water down, it cuts through a ridge. And that ridge of mountains uh, is from 10,000 to 15,000 feet high. It goes through what's called the Zungarian Gate. And to the left side of that gate is a tremendous dust storm. And that's really what caught our eye on this photo, was that huge dust storm blowing through there into China. Well, not only is the uh, geography neat to look at, but the meteorology, the weather that we get to see from orbit. We showed you a picture of Winnie, a super typhoon, earlier in the, in the movie. But uh, just to explain some of the capabilities, capabilities we have on board nowadays, the ground called us up and told us about Winnie and asked us to try to take a look at it when we went by. And just so happens, uh, we passed uh, pretty much right over Winnie just a few minutes later. And we had a digital electronic still camera on board. And we were able to take a few photos of that, that super typhoon. And then uh, it wasn't very many minutes later that we had a, uh, a downlink capability to Houston. And so we went, sent those images down through one of the computers that I showed you earlier. And uh, it wasn't within an hour or so that we had that kind of information out to the internet and to the public. So it's, uh, we've come a, a long way with our capability on the orbiter. And we hopefully we'll see more of that in the future. This may be a, a place that some of you folks have been before on some vacations, but the lake directly in the center is Lake Tahoe. And uh, to the left, you can see the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And the lake in the top right corner is a, a pyramid lake. It actually is on an Indian reservation. But if you draw a line between that lake and Lake Tahoe in the center, there's kind of a gray area about halfway between them, and that's Reno, Nevada, just to give you some idea of what green tree-type mountains look like in space, and then the desert on the uh, eastern side of the mountains. Also in the United States, this is the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Uh, the northern part is actually at the bottom. We're looking south uh, is at the top. There's a railroad causeway that goes right through the middle of this lake and actually bisects the, the two portions of the lake. The uh, southern part, which is a dark blue here, is very deep. And then the northern part, which is uh, red, is uh, the shallow part. And the reason it's red this time of the year, which, and it really surprised me because on my other flights it was a, a pale blue usually, but during this time of the year, brine shrimp flourish in the salt water of the Salt Lake, and that's what causes the water to be red. And this time of year, there's a lot of commercial uh, fishermen out there harvesting their brine shrimp to use for fish food. He had a very busy flight, and uh, once in a while, in fact, pretty often you'd be working away at something and uh, you'd glance out the window and see something that would just tempt you to stop. And uh, thank goodness we had lots of cameras. Uh, this is a view looking west as we zipped out over the Atlantic uh, back at Cape Cod and uh, Martha's Vineyard and uh, Nantucket Island. You can see the, the sun reflecting off the water and the various uh, current patterns and near the surface in the water. And uh, you can also clearly see all the uh, landlocked water on, on uh, ponds and, and lakes, and also a canal there on uh, Cape Cod itself. We did have a high inclination flight. I know this is a dark photograph, uh, but it's amazing we have it at all, I think. This is the Aurora Australis, the uh, southern lights, down over uh, southern Australia or even a little south of that. It's where most of our night passes uh, kind of bottomed out in our orbital trajectory. And uh, this was uh, just a, a wonderful sight to see. It was fascinating. And uh, it was uh, kind of a combination of physics and art sort of being held right out there in the sky. See, many of you know it, when energetic electrons come down and clobber uh, atmospheric, or not atmospheric, but atomic oxygen, it's well above the atmosphere, uh, they will uh, release the energy in the form of photons or fluoresce. And they fluoresce this uh, ghostly green. You can see the tail of uh, discovery there. Bjarni managed to get this photograph through some diligent effort with a long exposures and some very high-speed film, and I'm really glad he got it. 
And uh, we'll transition now from the Earth observation slides back into uh, the final slides that we've got for you today. And uh, this is entry day. You notice Bjarni and Jan are in blue, what looks like underwear, and that's because it is underwear. It's uh, been modified with liquid cooling tubes, and uh, we wear that under the orange suits that I've got on to keep us cool. And we've come a long ways the last few years in uh, keeping crews comfortable on the uh, landing and entry day. I'm in my suit. Uh, typically, the pilots are very excited on this day because up until now, the space shuttle has not been an airplane or a glider. On launch, we were a rocket, and then we transitioned into an orbiting spacecraft. But now, we're actually going to become an airplane, or I guess you'd say the fastest, heaviest glider in the world on this day, so we're very excited. As I mentioned, uh, they gave me the easy slides, and uh, no presentation like this would be complete without a landing photo. Uh, we are very, very happy to be back on the ground to see our friends and family. Unfortunately, we are already missing our, our home and space and the work we've been doing. Uh, we traveled uh, 4,725,000 miles, and we got together with our crew secretary and determined with NASA government rate of 30 cent a mile that <laughs> we're expecting $1,417,500 in our direct deposit account soon. <laughs> I promise I will divide it with you all. But actually, we um, had a very nice touchdown, and uh, as I mentioned before, Discovery performed flawlessly. We had a very busy and a very, um, very enjoyable mission. And it's always nice after we land, we uh, get into the crew transport vehicle to get out of the orbiter. We uh, kind of wash up a little bit, get into a flight suit out of our big launch and entry suit. And uh, it's always nice to get out of the vehicle or get out of the uh, uh, transport vehicle and get a chance to walk around the orbiter itself to see what a magnif magnificent machine that we all have created here that can go through the atmosphere and do the things that we, uh, we get to do. And uh, again, she came through in, in great shape. And we're all very excited, already looking forward to our next mission.